What's up guys, Thomas Malcho here from trainfully.com. In this video, I'm going to show you how to recover from what can be a very frustrating injury for a lot of people, a proximal hamstring tendinopathy. So if you've been suffering from deep buttock pain or deep posterior upper thigh pain, and the pain becomes worse during or after running, lunging, squatting, or sitting, then you might be suffering from a proximal hamstring tendinopathy, which is a painful condition that affects the hamstring tendons that connect the hamstring muscles to the pelvis. Most muscles are connected to bone by tendons. Now, a lot of people think the hamstring is one muscle. It's actually three muscles. We have the semimembranosus, the semitendinosus, and the biceps morus. All three hamstring muscles originate from the same spot on the pelvis called the ischial tuberosity, which is the sit bone. The biceps morus and the semitendinosus share a conjoined tendon that originates from the medial portion of the ischial tuberosity, whereas the semimembranosus has its own tendon that originates from the lateral portion of the ischial tuberosity. Its origin is also deeper and more proximal compared to the conjoined tendon. So there's two hamstring tendons that connect the three hamstring muscles to the pelvis. Now, a tendinopathy is a broad term that essentially means the tendon has become injured because it's been overloaded. Okay, so then how do we overload a hamstring tendon? Well, that's a pretty complex problem, but quite often it comes down to training errors, right? Maybe we did too much too soon, especially if we suddenly introduce activities like sprinting, lunging, or running up hills. These types of activities require the hamstring muscle to either contract or lengthen while the hip is in flexion. And when we contract or lengthen our hamstring muscle, when our hip is flexed, we increase the compressive and tensile load on the hamstring tendon where it attaches to the ischial tuberosity. And if the tendon doesn't have the capacity to deal with this increased load, then it can become overloaded. We also know that posture plays a role. If you have an anterior pelvic tilt, which is a sway back, that also increases the compressive and tensile load on the hamstring tendons. And we also know that having an anterior pelvic tilt can cause movement inefficiencies, which can increase wear and tear even more. Doing too much static stretching can also lead to a proximal hamstring tendinopathy. In fact, I see this quite a bit. I've had a number of people come to me that were doing a lot of yoga or Pilates. These activities have a lot of positions and stretches that involve end range hip flexion. And when you're in end range hip flexion, you're increasing the compressive and tensile load on the hamstring tendons. And if you're doing this every day, the tendons can become overloaded. Another way we can develop a hamstring tendinopathy is from sitting too much. When we sit, we're sitting on the ischial tuberosity. That's why we call it the sit bone. And remember, the hamstring tendons originate from the ischial tuberosity. So when we're sitting, we're compressing the hamstring tendons between the ischial tuberosity and the surface we're sitting on, right? So if we sit a lot, and especially if we sit on hard surfaces, we can eventually damage the hamstring tendons. So those are some of the ways that we can develop a hamstring tendinopathy. But how do we know the pain in our buttock is from the hamstring tendon, right? There's a lot of tissues in that area that can cause pain. How can we be sure that the hamstring tendon is the pain source? Well, we're gonna have to do an assessment. And the assessment always begins with a history of how the injury developed. Tendinopathies generally have a gradual insidious onset, which means they develop slowly over time, okay? So if your injury had a sudden onset, if you were running and you felt the injury when it happened, then that's probably not a hamstring tendinopathy. That's probably a hamstring strain, which is an injury to the muscle itself. We also know that deep hip flexion irritates a proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Right, so that means that if you have a proximal hamstring tendinopathy, activities like squatting, lunging, or sitting for prolonged periods should be painful. We also have some provocative tests that we can use. So the idea with these tests is to try and reproduce your pain by placing the proximal hamstring tendons under progressively increasing compressive and tensile load. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through three of these tests now. All right, so we're gonna do three tests. And remember, the purpose of these tests is to load the hamstring tendons, okay? And we're gonna progress the tests from a low load test 
to a moderate load test to a high load test. So if you have a proximal hamstring tendinopathy, we would expect the pain to get worse as we progress through these tests, okay? So we're gonna start with the low load test. This is the bent knee hamstring bridge. What I want you to do is lay on the floor and we'll have the symptomatic side. We'll put that foot on the floor. We'll lift the other side. Now, if both sides hurt, we'll do the test on both sides, okay? But if you only have pain on one side, only test that side. So from here, what I want you to do is slowly just lift your hip off the floor. And as we do that, we're loading the proximal hamstring tendon and just notice if you, if you feel any pain. Now, if you don't feel any pain, what we'll do is we'll just increase the speed. Okay, so now we'll speed it up a bit. See if that causes any pain. And if that doesn't cause any pain, we'll speed up once more and see if that causes pain. Now, if you don't feel any pain, we're gonna increase the load even further with the next test. All right, so this is the moderate load test, okay? Same idea, we're gonna get you on your back. Now, in that first test, the low load test, we had your knee bent somewhere in this angle here. For this test, I want you to straighten that knee until it's almost straight, okay? Dig the heel in. Same idea from here though, you're gonna lift your hips, See if there's any pain in your buttock. If there isn't, you can increase the speed. And see if there's any pain with that extra speed. All right, so now we have the high load test. Okay, so be careful with this one. This one can cause a lot of pain. So I want you standing on one leg and slowly just reach out, stretch that hamstring, Stress that hamstring tendon, see if you get any pain there, come back up. If you don't, you can speed up the movement a little bit and see if you have any pain there. Now, what do we do if we were unable to reproduce your pain with these tests? Well, the tests aren't perfect, okay? So even if we were unable to reproduce your pain with the test, you still might have a hamstring tendinopathy, but at this point, I would also be considering a deferential diagnosis. And at the top of my list would be deep luteal syndrome. So deep luteal syndrome is when the sciatic nerve gets entrapped or pinched by one of the tissues or structures in the deep posterior hip. And it too can cause deep buttock pain. So if we were unable to reproduce your pain with these provocative tests, I recommend you go to your doctor and have them check you for deep luteal syndrome. All right, so let's get into the rehab now. This is what we're here for, right? The key to rehabbing a tendinopathy, not just a hamstring tendinopathy, but any tendinopathy, is progressive loading, okay? So even though the hamstring tendon is damaged and it hurts, we want to load it because when we load tendons, we increase collagen production within the tendon and that allows the tendon to repair itself and become stronger, okay? The key though, is to load it progressively. Remember, the reason the tendon is damaged is because it was overloaded. So we need to start at a low level load and allow the tendon to become stronger progressively. We also need to monitor our pain. Okay, it's okay to feel some pain when we're doing the exercises, both during and after, but we want to keep that pain level at a three out of 10 or less. Okay, so zero means no pain, 10 means excruciating pain. We want our pain level to be between zero and three. So if you have an increase in symptoms after the exercises, that's okay as long as the symptoms settle within 24 hours. If they don't, that means you did too much and you need to back off a little bit. We also progress the rehab through a four stage program that typically takes three to six months to complete, although there is a lot of variability with that. So I'm gonna take you through the four stage program now. We begin our rehab in stage one with isometric hamstring loading. The term isometric means that we're not moving. Okay, so in stage one, all we're doing is performing static holds. Isometric exercises are really effective at reducing pain from tendinopathies. Now, although we wanna load the hamstring tendon, we don't wanna compress it. So to avoid compressing the tendon, 
we need to perform these exercises in a hip neutral position. Remember, when we move into hip flexion, we compress the hamstring tendon. The exercise we're gonna do is a long lever hamstring bridge. In week one, we're gonna perform five reps of 30 second double leg hamstring bridge holds in the morning and five reps of 30 second hamstring bridge holds in the afternoon. Okay, so we're doing that twice a day. Five reps in the morning, five reps in the afternoon. You can take 30 to 60 second rest between reps. In week two, we're gonna stick with the double leg, but we're gonna increase the duration to 45 seconds. So five reps of 45 second holds in the morning and five reps of 45 second holds in the afternoon. In week three, we're gonna progress the exercise from double leg to single leg, but we'll reduce the duration back down to 30 seconds. So five reps of 30 second single leg holds in the morning, and five reps of 30 second single leg holds in the afternoon. In week four, we're gonna stick with the single leg reps, but we're gonna increase the duration to 45 seconds. So five reps of 45 second holds in the morning and five reps of 45 second holds in the afternoon. All right, now in stage two, we have isotonic hamstring loading. So the term isotonic means that there's a normal muscle contraction, okay? So there's some movement with these exercises. Now, although there is some movement with these exercises, we still wanna be careful not to compress the hamstring tendon too much. So we're still gonna limit the amount of hip flexion we have. We're gonna do three exercises. The first exercise is an eccentric knee extension. So this means we're lengthening the hamstring under load. So we're only gonna do the eccentric contraction with this exercise. You're gonna start with your hips up, slowly slide your heel away, so your leg becomes almost straight and then you can drop your hips down, reset and start again. 10 repetitions of three second eccentric contractions. The second exercise is a long lever isotonic hamstring bridge. So this is very similar to stage one, but instead of doing an isometric exercise, this is isotonic. So we have some movement with this exercise. We're gonna have a three second concentric contraction and then a three second eccentric contraction. And we're gonna do 10 repetitions. The third exercise is the mini lunge. So this is a lunge, but we're reducing the range of motion again to reduce the amount of compression that we have on the hamstring tendon. Three seconds on the way down, three seconds on the way up, 10 repetitions. So we're gonna do two to three sets of each exercise once a day, every other day. And on the days that we're not doing these isotonic exercises, I want you to do the isometric exercises from stage one. Now, the goal of stage three is to continue with the isotonic hamstring loading, but to progress the exercises to involve more hip flexion. Okay, so we're starting to introduce more compressive load on the hamstring tendon now. We're gonna do three exercises. The first exercise is a slow hip thrust. So you can use a stability ball or a bench or your couch to put your back on, and you're gonna slowly lower your hips, take three seconds on the way down, this is the eccentric contraction, and then three seconds on the way up, which is the concentric contraction. 10 repetitions. The second exercise is a reverse lunge. You're gonna step back, lower into a lunge, take three seconds on the way down, three seconds on the way up, 10 repetitions. The third exercise is a single leg Romanian deadlift. We're gonna take three seconds on the way down, three seconds on the way up, 10 repetitions. If you need help balancing, you can hold on to a chair. The dosage and frequency of these exercises in stage three is the same as in stage two. So we're gonna do two to three sets of these exercises once a day 
every other day. And on the day that we're not doing these exercises, we're going to do the isometric exercise from stage one. All right, now for stage four, the final stage, we're going to introduce a power elastic stimulus. Okay, so this is the most provocative stage. It can cause the most pain. And so we have to be very conservative with our approach and we may want to limit the amount of hip flexion we have in these exercises. We're going to do two exercises. The first exercise is a lunge jump. So you're gonna begin in the lunge position, jump up in the air, switch your legs and land on the other side in a repeating tempo. We're gonna do 10 to 20 repetitions. The second exercise is called the ice skater. So here we're just bounding in the frontal plane from side to side. So a single leg jump, laterally side to side. Again, you may want to limit the amount of hip flexion you have on the landings, but as you progress, you can start to increase the amount of hip flexion. 10 to 20 repetitions. Now, because these exercises in stage four are such high intensity, we only want to perform them every third day. A stage one day would then follow to help settle the tendon down, and then the following day, would be a strengthening day, either the exercises from stage two or stage three. So in stage four, this is a three-day program. We go from high intensity to low intensity to medium intensity, and then we take a day off and we repeat. So we're doing that twice a week. High, low, medium, day off, high, low, medium. All right, guys, so you can expect to spend about four weeks in each phase. So typically the rehab process takes about three to six months. But like I said before, there is a lot of variability with this. And if you need help trying to finesse your way through all of this, please reach out to me. That's what I'm here for. Now, if you're looking for somebody to help you recover from injuries and enhance your performance, head over to trainfully.com and join my inner circle. By joining my inner circle, I become your rehab specialist and performance coach, but at a fraction of what it costs to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.